the, uh, the chat on this. All right, so we are ready and going. Everybody's muted, and we had some questions come in on genetics that I want to touch on and remind everybody that if they did a 23andMe and we have not yet gone over those results with you, that you call the clinic and make sure that we get scheduled to go over those results and they will tell you, did you get your results back from 23andMe? Again, as I post on the Facebook page, we do not get notification from 23andMe. If you did your genetics through 23andMe, they only notify you and they notify you via email that your results are in and then we will need to download the raw data from their site, so we'll need your username and password to do so. If you did your genetics through us, through the new genetic test that we have, um, that is different. We get the results back, and we will let you know when they're ready. So um, that is the that is the difference. Okay, so we will go right into this and get started. All right, so uh, other thing I want to, a little announcement prior to that for those that are local to us, if you have friends or family that want to do a thermography, we are doing our special, that same special that we did last year, the $50 off the Breast Cancer Awareness um, for the Breast Cancer Awareness Month for October. We're doing it September, October, November to get your initial and your follow-up if you have any local friends that want to do that uh you they can book now now get into the questions the first question does or can your genetic analysis program combine both husband and wife results to show potential weaknesses or potential defects for uh children um and uh uh, we can't do that. So you could look, you could do a graph on, you know, the old genetic graph that you learned in college of XY and XY and the, here's the mother and here's the father and what's the chance of the kids having. Knowing the, knowing the genetics of the mother and the father, you can extrap extrapolate some data to know that the percentage chance that a child is going to have defects on certain genes like if the if the mother has a a two on their mthfr gene and the father has a two on their mthfr gene that means they're positive positive then you know the children are all going to have a two but if the father is a one and the mother's a one each child has a 50 percent chance of being a two and a 50 percent chance of being a one and, and if the mother is a one and the father is a zero, so it gets more complicated. So you can only give chances and you'd have to extrapolate each gene or the software doesn't do that because it's only gonna give a percentage, each child will have a percentage chance of having a specific defect. So you can't really do that. You could get some ideas if you had both parents. So let's say if you're looking at the ABP1 gene that, that detoxifies um, and get, helps you get rid of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and you have a two and your husband has a two, then you know your kids have a two, so they shouldn't be taking Advil, um, at least not on a regular basis, or Tylenol or something like that. So that would give you some ideas, so you wouldn't necessarily have to do the test to find out that one thing. If you knew the father and the mother's genetic profile, you'd get a pretty good idea. But to really know your kid's profile, they have to do their own genetic profile. And then that brings up the question, okay, well, I have a one-year-old. Can we do a genetic profile on a one-year-old? Well, technically you can, but you can't get them to spit in the tube. So in order to collect enough saliva to run the genetic test, they have to be old enough to know how to spit in a tube. Um, of course, your kids are spitting all over the place, but you can't get them to spit where you want them to spit. So that's kind of the way it is. But um, so they have to be old enough to be able to spit in the tube to be able to run the genetic profile. But however old that is for your child to know how to do that, that's when you can start running genetic tests on your kids. And understand, in order to do a genetic workup on family members, remember we have that family special. 
um, because it's inevitable. Uh, almost every patient that we run genetics on, after we go over their genetics, the, they want to run genetics on family members. Um, so um, uh, we have that availability to make it affordable for families to get their genes done. So make sure you take advantage of that too. Somebody asked a question on the chat. Uh, what causes leg cramping and do you have any suggestions to alleviate that? Um, just a little bit off subject there, but um, leg cramping, it can be multiple reasons. I actually did a video on it probably about eight, nine months ago. If you go back and search the Facebook feed uh, through that, but um, most common causes of leg cramping are going to be mineral deficiencies even iron deficiencies, different anemias can cause leg cramping. Obviously, electrolyte deficiency is the most common thing. Um, and dealing with leg cramping is you take some electrolytes before bed, that can be helpful. Um, re restless legs is a little bit different, though it can be tied to that same thing. Uh, leg cramping is a muscular condition. So if you're really talking about Charlie horses in the legs, that's the muscles going into spasm. Um, usually that's tied to electrolytes. So make sure you're getting enough minerals, that you're absorbing your minerals, so that also, just like everything, it ties to leaky gut issues and you're taking a good source of minerals. And we talked at length about that in other videos too, about getting minerals that are chelated the way plants would chelate minerals. Uh, so taking a, an organic plant-based mineral is the way to go. Um, all right, back to our subject on genetics. Another question was, are there genetic causes to cancer? Uh, and there are genetic causes to cancer. So that's what our whole book about cancer genes is about. And I would recommend that you uh, go to our website and go under the genetic tab um, on our therapy tabs and uh, go down and see the tab that says cancer genes the book you'll click on it you'll go to this uh, page right here that now has um, a whole bunch of videos um, there's probably 30 videos so far on cancer, the cancer genes remember the book that, that I'm creating with this is a video book for you to watch the videos and learn about them. So, but when you usually are talking about causes of cancer with cancer genes, you're talking about oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes. Now what an oncogene is, onco is a Latin uh, prefix for a cancer, where we get the word oncology, uh, and gene is your genetic. So there are certain genes that can act as tumor promoter genes. Those are called oncogenes. Certain genes that if there are defects on that gene, it can actually promote tumor growth or promote cancer growth. That's what's called an oncogene. Now, Typically, there are defects in genes that do other things, but the defect causes it to promote rapid growth. So um, God didn't give us genes that make cancer, but when we have defects in certain genes, it can promote growth. Uh, also, the, one of the ways that oncogenes promote growth is certain genes that we refer to as oncogenes that when they have defects, they promote growth. They do so by inhibiting tumor suppressor genes. So tumor suppressor genes, when we talk about genetic causes of cancer, um, that is the most common thing that we see, defects in tumor suppressor genes. So God did give us certain genetics, certain genes that are now labeled tumor suppressor genes because when they turn on, they suppress growth. So knowing in his sovereignty that we are gonna be living in a fallen world and exposure to all sorts of chemicals and toxins and biochemicals and all these different things are gonna damage cells and damage cell membranes and damage nuclei. 
and cause, uh, because of um, damage to nucleus, to uh, uh, nuclei of cells which are responsible for cell replication, can cause a cell to go into rapid replication. That's what cancer is. So anything that gets inside the cell that can affect the replication centers of the nucleus can cause the cell to go into rapid replication. If that does take place, and I should say when that does take place, because this happens on every human being, something gets in the cell, causes the cell to go into rapid replication, it starts to replicate. It is by definition cancer but we are a long ways away from being diagnosed with cancer at this time because our cells have, have ways to combat this. And one of the primary ways to combat this is, is the turning on of, of certain genes called your tumor suppressor genes. Your tumor suppressor genes are genes that um, suppress uh, growth. So if there is rapid replication that's taking place, the tumor suppressor genes turn on and cause the cell to go through apoptosis. Remember, apoptosis is normal programmed cell death. So cause the cell to die. So we're going to kill the cell because it's in rapid replication. Your tumor suppressor genes turn on and cause apoptosis. So when we're looking at genetic causes to cancer, we have to look at these tumor suppressor genes. And the most common one that you probably heard of is the BRCA genes. There are numerous BRCA genes, the BRCA1 and the BRCA2 gene families, we should say. So these gene families are tumor suppressor genes specifically for the, the hormonal driven cancers in women mainly. So the breast cancer, the ovarian cancer, the uterine cancer, the endometrial cancer. That's where the BRCA genes will kick in if there's any, any rapid replication of cells, the tumor suppressor BRCA genes kick in and turn off that growth by causing apoptosis, causing cell death, and therefore you never get a diagnosis of cancer. In truth, this has happened to every single woman on the planet that's ever lived. They've gotten cancer, their BRCA genes kick on, kills the cell, you never get cancer. So technically, did they have cancer? Yes, they technically had cancer. Did they ever get diagnosed with cancer? No, because your body killed it the way it was supposed to take place. The problem comes in is when a person has a lot of defects in these tumor suppressor genes, then they don't kick in very well so that when and if cancer starts to grow in the breast, the BRCA tumor suppressor system doesn't kick in because of the defects in this gene as well as if it didn't have defects in the gene and this person is more susceptible to cancer. Now understand, your body has other fail-safe methods to kill a growing cancer. You have your immune response, you have other tumor suppressor genes, many, many other tumor suppressor genes, I'm just using the BRCA as an example here, that could kick in and help kill this growing cancer in this person's breast. But there's, there's problems that are taking place. So when a person has a diagnosis of cancer, we know that Apoptosis didn't take place. It is not taking place in those cells. That's why they're still growing. There's rapid replication taking place in those cells caused by something that got into just one cell to begin with, and it could have been something that got into that cell 40, 50 years ago, but now has damaged the replication cycle and the cell's going through rapid replication. Therefore, that's what cancer is. And there has been a failure in our in multiple fail-safe systems. So one of the fail-safe systems to keep us from getting cancer are our tumor suppressor systems. So in order for me to get a full diagnosis of cancer and have cancer growing inside of me, there had to be at one point of failure in that system. It may not be due to defects in that system, talking about genetic defects in the BRCA or the P53 gene or whatever, but it could be just overwhelmed. It wasn't able to keep up with this cancer that was growing so rapidly. But defects are a piece of it. So genetic defects on tumor suppressor genes can be a cause to cancer.
or we more appropriately said, can be a cause to a person not being able to suppress a growing cancer. So we want to look at those because there are some uh, nutraceutical interventions one can do if they have defects on those genes. So if I have defects on my P53 gene, the most researched tumor suppressor gene, oh, well, there are there's research studies that show that using things like curcumin, turmeric, can really help support the P53 system. Uh, with my BRCA genes, there's evidence that there's specific nutraceuticals that can help support defects in that system. It's, you know, that's just a way to look at it. So would it be a wise idea to get somebody's genetic profile when they're 15 years old so that, boy, uh, you have a whole mess of defects on your BRCA genes. It'd be really good for you to be taking this product on a regular basis to help support that. Uh, or, you know, that, that's just wise doctoring, I think. That's just wise medicine is trying to prevent disease um, by looking at every factor that you can. I mean, we were taught in school, you get a really good family history. Are there cancers in the family? Oh, my mom had breast cancer at 44. My grandma got breast cancer at when she was 49. My great-grandma had endometrial cancer when she was in her 30s. Wow probably pretty good chance there's some defects in some tumor suppressor genes that are genetically carried down in your family that are linking these together. Should we look at those and try to support those systems prior to you getting cancer? So that's why we look at um, genetics. Not that genetics are the cause to every cancer, but they're a piece of it just like diet is, just like toxins are, just like everything else is. So the more ways that you can look at it, I think the better you're going to be able to support the patient. That's why we created these videos. So make sure you go to our website that um, those videos are available to everybody, whether you're a patient or not, and you can start walking through that. If you already received your genetic report and myself or Ann or Ashley have sent you the the um, PDF part of the report with all your genes, then you could, if you really want to get nerdy, you could go through those videos and look at your PDF and scroll through it when, when I'm talking about the specific gene families, and it could be a real great educational moment for you if uh, you get tired of watching Mayberry or something like that, then this is, gives you something else to do. All right. So we are going to open it up to questions here. Uh, let's try to keep to one question per person if we can. So everybody, I can hear you. So um, ask a question that I will mute it for everybody too. Dr. Connors, this is Deb Swartz. Um, you, you were just talking about the demography and um, how you're having a, a, well, a special on it. But anyway, I had my thermomic, thermomic, thermogram in March, and I came to see you in, I think, May, and everything was okay. But in July, my, my cancer was active again and in, my, in my upper chest. But in the thermography, it says that left upper chest was inflamed. But this showed up on my right side. Why wasn't that shown up on the thermography? Um, I don't. I don't know. I'm going to mute everybody here so I can hear. Um, I don't know. So what's going to what you're going to see on thermography is what is metabolically active right at the time that you take that picture. So um, it is it is extremely sensitive. Uh, and I've told many of you before that when, when we first got the thermography, I wanted to see how sensitive it is. So I took a picture of the wall, and of course there was no heat really coming off of the wall. All I did is put my hand on the wall, hardly touching the wall, took my hand off, took another picture, and you could see my hand as if my hand was there. So it, it picked up that heat just from my hand on the wall. It is picking up heat. So it is going to pick up 
uh, um, any greater heat in your body, which could be due to an inflammatory process, uh, or if, I mean, literally, if you just poked yourself, you're going to see that heat from your hand um, picked up. That's why you have to be careful before we do thermography. Um, uh, there could have been, you know, so there's all sorts of explanations why, oh, how come I didn't see the heat in my colon cancer? Well, if it's too deep, um, that it's not creating heat at the surface, you're not going to see it on thermography. So it's only going to show it what's happening at the surface, but you can look at the surface and get some idea what's taking place deep inside. Um, so that's the benefit of using, you know, if you want to use thermography to its best benefit, you want to use it fairly regularly. And I know a lot of people will do breast screenings on an annual basis if they don't have breast cancer, which seems to be adequate, but it's, it's inexpensive enough to do it more regularly. So the more regular you can do it, the better. And we've even had patients um, that were local that we would um, take pictures on a much more regular basis and not submit them to be read, which um, that's where the expense comes in. It says we have to have them read by a radiologist. Okay, okay. any other questions? <laughs> Nothing. You're gonna let me off early tonight. Can I? Can I? Since no one else has any questions, I got more. Um, okay, I'm always. Person. Um, the thermography. I have. This is my third one, and um, so you had some. They had some comparisons to it, but that's okay. I got another one. I was recently um, listening to uh, um, people about airway obstructions, and they were saying that um, this is very all our um, everything that you know, read about cancer. Clear your mouth up. Get your your dental things all in order and everything, and this um, so you can treat your cancer and make sure. And then you also concentrate on the colon. If you have sleep apnea and TMJ, does this affect our cancer? Yeah, sleep apnea and TMJ? Yes. So TMJ, I would say no, not so much. So temporal, your TMJ is your temporal mandibular joint. That's the jaw, your jaw joint. So TMJ is a term used for any dysfunction of that joint, and it's usually a structural dysfunction. The person got injured, they have muscle weakness. There's all sorts of different causes to that but that's not necessarily gonna be tied to cancer in any way. Um, infections in the mouth, yes, are tied to cancer very often, tied to heart disease very often as well. There, there's numerous research studies that show that. Sleep apnea is totally different. So sleep apnea has to do with partly, I'm gonna, Mute everybody here. Partly sleep apnea has to do with a neurological component in the brain where the person stops breathing at night. Now there's many different theories of sleep apnea. It's part of the epiglottis. A person has extra weight gain, increased expansion of the um, larynx uh, to a straight neurological cause in the, in the breathing centers of the brain. But Regardless of what the cause is, it's going to cause a decreased oxygenation while the person's sleeping, and that could be a leading cause of a lot of problems, especially you start thinking of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and brain-based issues like that. Now, how would it tie into cancer? Well, if you have a decreased oxygenation of tissues, you're going to have tissues uh, cancer cells functioning and thriving more through the Warburg effect, which was discovered by Otto Warburg back almost 100 years ago, where cancer cells can feed off of and learn to live in an anaerobic, meaning a lack of oxygen, condition where they're feeding off of lactic acid. So you could potentially by having sleep apnea, uh, 
be not helping your cancer. Would I say sleep apnea would be a cause of cancer? I would say most likely not. Um, would a person with sleep apnea not be helping themselves heal from cancer if they're not using their CPAP machine, I would say it certainly can be a contributor. You need to get proper oxygenation uh, in your tissues in order to be able to help kill cancer. I've said it multiple times that a, uh, uh, an oxygenated tumor is uh, a dying tumor. So that's the idea of using, um, getting out and getting oxygenation, getting some exercise, doing hyperbaric oxygen therapy, you're increasing the oxygenation to the tumor and you're um, increasing that uh, cell death response to the tumor. So make sure you're not, um, not um, neglecting your, your uh, sleep apnea if that is an issue. Can I continue with you? Are you familiar with the ALF, ALF device? I'm not familiar with that, no, huh? Okay, it's by, um, a scientist, uh, um, his name, he's from Sweden again. Um, oh, gosh. I have to get back. I have to email you him. He, that, that he's been helping a lot of maldeformed children um, open up their airway so that they get the proper oxygen, breathing techniques and stuff. And I just didn't know if that would be a route to help um, oxygenate ourselves so that we wouldn't be, you know, unoxygenated and contributing to cancer. So that, that was my question. Okay. His name's a doctor. So helping oxygenate the cancer, helping increase oxygenation is is beneficial. And that's what we talk about. What kind of exercise does a cancer patient want to do? They want to do an exercise that's going to increase oxygenation, but maybe not do um, heavy aerobic exercise where they're leaving their tissues in a hypoxic state. Um, so maybe that's not the best exercise for a cancer patient. You want to be out walking, getting some exercise, getting breathing, but not finding yourself completely out of breath, panting, or working out for uh, to run a marathon. Okay, this doctor's name is Dr. Derek Nordstrom okay. from Norway, and um, he just came up with this. Also, it was EWAT. Would that be a good good um, therapy to get involved with? So EWAT is exercise with oxygen therapy, and yep, that can be a good thing. So you're using a, typically EWAT, you're using an, some sort of source of external oxygen, like an oxygen tank or a, or a um, um, oxygen concentrator, and then you're walking on a treadmill or riding on a stationary bike while you're breathing in a greater concentration of oxygen, and that could be another great tool. Okay, thank you. Okay, anybody else with any other questions? Dr. Connors, this is Donna Brujar. Hello, Donna. Um, hello, how are you? Um, I had a question. I just had my blood work done at the oncologist, and my, can uh, my calcium is way out of range. It's 11.2. Okay. And, can you um, can you send that to me? I, I will send it when I get everything. Uh, they forgot to do the myeloma testing for some reason. So as soon as I get the, those test results back, I will send them all to you. Okay. Um, but I was concerned about the calcium because um, the myeloma is what's taking the calcium from the bone. And it has been down to 10 at, at one point. Now it's back up and, and it went up again from the last time I was there, had a blood test in April. Okay, so the concern with high calcium levels is that you have osteoclastic um, activity going on somewhere right. in your body. Yeah. So that means the breakdown of bone somewhere in your body and with multiple myeloma, that's part of the problem with multiple myeloma is it attacks the bones. So right. um, yes, so we need to address that. Um, and so, 
What's that? I didn't say anything. Okay. Somebody else. Okay, was so um, we do need to address that. So if you could get me those labs, then we'll have a call. Okay. Uh, I'll do that. It'll be next week. Okay. Sounds good. Get it for a month. HBO and watch it. All right. Well, we will. Hello, Dr. Connors. Hello. Yes. Hello, this is Jane. And I have, Hi, a, Jane. Question of, I have a question about histamines. Uh -huh. um, I'm looking at your list of high histamine level foods, and I'm a little confused. Uh, for sir. example, it says um, high histamine foods are beans and pulses, and it says chickpeas, soybeans, peanuts. Are those the only beans that should that are high histamine, or are you saying that all beans are high histamine? You know that, I was watching that show that time. Well, um, I put it on pause. Oops. Okay. And then it I'm going to mute everybody here again because we're getting feedback. Okay, so remember with histamines, uh, make sure you go back and watch some of the videos on histamines because it'll help you because it gets confusing with histamines. Most foods have histamine in it. Uh, so it's you're never going to be able to hide from histamines completely. Uh, almost all foods, the older they are, have more histamines. So leftover foods have more histamines than fresher foods. So if you're going to make a big dinner and eat it all week long because it's going to be leftovers in the fridge, uh, by the time the third day comes, it's got a lot more histamines than the first day. And there's different studies that have measured that, and sometimes it could triple, quadruple over time. So you're not, the idea is that you're not, you're not um, expelling histamines from your diet. You are trying to decrease your histamine load. So if a person has defects, especially in the ABP1 genes that break down histamine in the gut by secreting the DAO enzyme, that means defects in that gene, I don't have a lot of histamine breakdown enzyme in my gut, then you want to decrease your histamine consumption. So uh, decreasing your histamine consumption is then just looking at that chart of high histamine foods, staying away from, I think on that chart, are the, I think they're in red or are they in light? I can't remember on that chart. Um, and then the ones that are in bold are the ones that have the, are things that have the least amount of histamine in it. But there isn't any way that you're going to get rid of all histamines. So just try to stay away. All beans have histamine. All nuts have histamine in them. Um, so should I never eat beans anymore? Should I never eat nuts anymore? No, but maybe if I have issues with histamine, I'm not going to eat a handful of nuts. I can still have some nuts on my salad. The more foods you mix them in with, you're going to have less of a histamine load in your gut at any given time. Uh, or if I know I'm going to eat something that's very high histamine, um, then I could take a histamine enzyme with that, that, that uh, ABP1 uh, assist product that we have, or the histo DAO product, that's the straight histamine enzyme. Um, that's how you want to look at histamine. You want to look at it as a, a bucket that you are going to fill, but you don't want that bucket uh, tipping over. Um, that's all. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. And I'll, I'll watch those videos too. That would be interesting. Thank you. Oh, you bet. Does freezing food help? Um, does it still include histamine as you No, histamine research? is an amino acid, so it doesn't die. It's not a living organism. So freezing doesn't, if, like you said, you stored it for a week and it increases in histamine. Well, yeah, freezing if you freeze it, it probably won't increase in histamine. <laughs> okay, thank you. Stacy, you had a question? Anybody else? Okay, we will end that here then, and I will get this, the recording up for you guys. So everybody can hear it. I'll get it up on Facebook.
Um, make sure if you have any personal questions, again, just email those questions. Your name will be taken off of it. And you won't have to worry about any embarrassment or anything like that. Um, and if you have other questions that you think would be good for everybody to hear that um, is between these times that we do these calls, make sure you post it on Facebook and we'll try to get that answered as well. All right, thanks everybody. And we will talk again soon. Thank, Thank you, you Dr. Thank you. Thank you. You bet.